it's Valentine's Day, and that means that it's all about love. And there are records of love in the fossil record. Or, maybe not quite love, but at least some animals died while trying to uh, propagate their species. That's, that's an appropriate way to put it, right? Now this video isn't going to be about the evolution of the first exchange of genetic material like that, because that's older than the first fossils that we have, but we are going to be looking at some very specific cases that tell us a lot about how certain animals actually made sure their species continued. And that is especially true of the only vertebrate that has a fossil that's like this. And it's actually a turtle coming from Germany. A Leocellus crassus sculpta isn't actually that strange to find in this part of Germany, specifically the Messel Pit, where there's a ton of really, really great fossils, including some of the first primates ever found. These fossils come from about 47 million years ago, and like I said, they're not that uncommon. There's a lot of them. But there's nine of them that are a little bit more interesting. Well, I say nine, it's really 18 because it's nine pairs of them. And that's because they're found together, kind of like this. Now it's been suggested that these animals were mating, but there's a little bit better evidence for that now because people looked at what kind of turtles these ones were related to. And it turns out they were in the group Herodochelidae, which are actually still around today, it just happens to be they're kind of on the opposite side of the planet. The only genus of this group that's actually still alive are the pig-nosed turtles of Australia and New Guinea. And when these ones mate, they actually line up their tails in a way to make sure everything works, but it's also pretty distinctive. Which means when we're looking at the fossil turtles of Aleochelus, you can see those tails lining up, and that means they're mating. But we can still tell that it is actually one male and one female, and that's because males have longer tails in turtles, but also females have plastral kinesis, which the plastron is just the kind of belly part of the shell, and it can fold a little bit in these turtles. But why is it this turtle? Why aren't there fossils of other turtles that are having the same thing happening? Well, it comes down to something that's actually really unique in the group Carotochelidae, and that's that they have kind of permeable skin. Most turtles still have scales, they're just really, really small, and they still do kind of shed them the way most other reptiles do. But this group of turtles, they just kind of did away with that and made their skin much more permeable. It's actually kind of like amphibians, where amphibians can breathe through their skin these turtles can actually do that in the water to some degree, pulling in oxygen that's dissolved in the water. But that also means if there's toxins in the water, they're going to absorb those. And the Messel Pit, it was pretty toxic. The Messel Pit Lake was a mar, which is a volcanic lake, and throughout the bottom part of this volcanic lake, there would have been a lot of toxins and toxic chemicals kind of slowly just leaking into the bottom parts. This is actually really similar to some modern day lakes, like Lake Nios in Cameroon, which would have had this similar layer of toxic gases at the bottom of it. And then a landslide led to an eruption in 1986, and the resulting toxic gas that spilt from this volcano killed over 1,700 people. And this is because those chemicals cause different densities in the water, and they generally separate out, which means it takes a large event to suddenly have all of those gases spit up into the top. Now the Messel Pit was probably similar, it would have had more toxic water on the bottom and clearer water on the top, but that also means that animals could live in the top layer of water and not have too much concern about the more toxic chemicals deeper, because that's going to cause a different density in that water and so it's going to kind of form a separation, just a physical barrier between those two different layers. But that's where the turtle's porous skin comes in, because I, they, they breathe through the water. They did the same thing that many different amphibians do. And that means that what probably happened is these turtles were getting intimate with one another and lost track of where exactly they were in the water column and slowly sank down into the toxic depths. And before they knew it, they were dead and sinking to the bottom. But that really toxic water is why we have such great fossils from the Messel Pit, because essentially that also killed off all the bacteria that would have broken down the bodies. It's why we have so much great preservation coming from here. But it's also why this specific turtle in this specific location is the only vertebrate we have actually in the process of mating in the fossil record. But there are more cases of invertebrates being caught in the act in the fossil record, such as these frog hoppers coming from the middle Jurassic of China. This is actually kind of interesting because these frog hoppers, you can see which one's male and which one's female, in part because they're mating in basically the same way that modern frog hoppers do. It's a little bit strange, but with the last two parts of the abdomen of the male being twisted, it's a very similar pattern to what we see in these modern ones, 
but that also means that they kept that same pattern for at least 165 million years. So there wasn't any kind of random adaptation or mutation that caused them to change their mating behavior. And that's something that if it was really important, could have actually been changed really quickly. Essentially, if one frog hopper has some sort of mating behavior that causes its offspring to become more successful, that's gonna spread to the rest of the population really quickly. But that's not what we see with these frog hoppers. It's again, just kind of this same system. If it's not broken, don't fix it. I mean, it is kind of a dead bedroom, but you know, it works for them, I guess. But we don't need the actual fossils of the animals getting it on to understand at least a bit about how they got it on. And that's especially true of ostracods because they were very prolific in the fossil record. That means we have a lot of fossils of them. And even if we don't have any too actively in the act, we can still understand a lot because we have preservation of many of the adaptations that they use in order to propagate their species. And that includes some ostracods have giant sperm up to a whole centimeter long. And some fossils actually, you can still see this coiled up in the males. And so that means that adaptation, which we've found in the Miocene in parts of Australia, but also in Cretaceous Amber that's 100 million years old, it was around for a long time and that seemed to have been very beneficial for them. And only some groups of ostracods have this, so it's not entirely clear why some of them do and some of them don't. But for the ones that do, they're pretty numerous even today, so it's working out for them. But it's not just invertebrates, because most mammals also have at least some kind of specialized tissue in order to help reproduction. And that's actually the baculum, which humans don't have, but many of our nearest living relatives, such as chimpanzees and gorillas, do have. And I'll touch on that here in a little bit, but a baculum is essentially just a penis bone. And again, most mammals have this. It's something that just kind of helps everything work out, helps support the different muscles and tissues that go into it. And just to give a sense of how many different mammals have these, there is an entire paper just on the bacula that have been found at just the La Brea tar pits. So if you have good preservation quality, you can get a lot of these. But there's been some looks at other groups that aren't alive today, and it potentially means some similar, but also some different things about how they may have reproduced. And this is specifically true in the Borophagine dogs. The Borophagines are the bone crushing dogs, and they're not directly related to any modern day dog. However, we have bacula from them, which means we can compare it to modern day dogs and try and understand how they did things. Now they are still pretty similar to those in modern day dogs, which means there's probably some of the same behaviors. So for example, when copulating, they probably did that for a little while. However, also there wasn't any specific breeding season. It seems like it was more spontaneous in when they could actually breed. Essentially, if conditions are good, they could just go for it. It's still not a perfect example though, because Borophagine bacula generally have a little bit more of a curvature to them rather than modern dog bacula. So while there are still some similarities, we can still tell they were doing something slightly differently. So a lot of these things that we thought were pretty basic, like I mentioned with the other insects, the frog hoppers, maybe these borophagine dogs did something that increased their fecundity, increased the amount of offspring they could produce at once, and maybe it was attached to the shape of the bacula. It's hard to know for sure, but whatever the case, it is something that is subject to change. I mean, heck, look at humans. Humans don't have a bacula. And that brings me to one of the funnier papers looking at reproduction in the fossil record, because it's just kind of proposing an idea. There's no real hard data for it, but essentially goes, hey, humans became self-aware and they realized, well, if I break that guy's bacula, he's not gonna have a shot at reproduction. And essentially male competition is why baculas fail to be maintained in humans. Why they disappeared, because humans got too smart for their own good, essentially. <laughs> Which, looking at how much we've talked about sex in the fossil record, maybe we are getting too smart for our own good.